Yes, without a doubt, the best catch of the year, Don Maynard. Don Maynard, rest in peace. He's the first receiver to 10,000 career yards in NFL history. Hi, everyone. This is Will O'Toole welcoming you to another edition of Sports uh, History here on Park Ridge Channel. This week, I'd like to explore the career of Don Maynard, not just on the professional level with the New York Jets and also a couple other teams, but also, uh, quite surprisingly, his, his stay at UTEP, or what was once known as Texas Western, of course, today it is now the University of Texas, El Paso. Uh, but Howard and Howard Fredericks and I, we saw this and we said, uh, it, the passing of Don Maynard, truly one of my favorite players growing up. Actually, I have two favorite wide receivers. One is Drew Pearson of the Cowboys. The other is Freddie Bolitnikoff of the Oakland Raiders. And I always liked Don Maynard, uh, although I always hated his helmet with the, the one bar uh, option that he took with his football helmet. Never realized that he didn't play purposely without a chin strap. I always thought it got lost in all of the the violence that was on the football field, especially against the Raiders and the Chiefs. So uh, I would like to go over a guy who's probably, uh, I'm not saying he's up there in the upper echelon of players, but he did, he was, when you think about it, uh, quite an achiever, number one. And number two, he's kind of overlooked in the, high echelon of wide receivers. And I and, and let's be fair, I think all wide receivers start with Jerry Rice of the 49ers and also the Raiders, but they go from Jerry Rice and then basically it's everybody after Jerry Rice. Uh, I, I, Rice was just an incredible prolific player. Yes, you can say that he played for great 49ers teams, but uh, did they make him or did he help make the 49ers great? It's always an interesting question with all of these Hall of Fame players. Uh, who really sets the tone? I think it's quite obvious that, you know, the Ruth and the Gurrigs really were the identity of the New York Yankees. Yastrzemski with the 67 Red Sox. He's just one of those guys I'm just uh, pointing out. Of course, my favorite player, Johnny Bench, really being, really, when you think about it, the signature player of the Reds during the 70s. You got to you got to remember of those core four players that the Reds had: Perez, uh, Foster, Bench, uh, even Concepcion and um, and Rose. Really, Concepcion and Bench were the only ones who stayed with the Reds for their whole career. And I'm putting Concepcion there uh, only because it was more like a core five with the Reds. Once they got the acquisition of Morgan, they just took off. Anyway, I would like to just you know just highlight the cartoon. You know, Howard always says, hey, it's uh, maybe maybe it, it, it's a devotion to the passing of players. But, you know, this is sports history. And it's I, I think it's perfectly legit to really look at the players. And sometimes it is the passing of them that really helps us recognize how great a player they were on the football field. So I'm going to take a look at that. And. I'm, I'm going to start with Maynard's career. I didn't know too much about him until I started, you know, referencing him. Uh, I did like Joe Namath. I always loved his his uh, quarterback uh, helmet uh, with the multiple bars and all the rest. But still to this day, I think the Super Bowl win. And you know what? Maybe I'll get it up at the end of the show. Uh, the cover of the Super Bowl. Uh, victory by the Jets in 1969. I, I think that was quintessential Joe Namath, him uh, shooting the water, water from the water bottle into his uh, into his mouth. And also, you know, the eye glare and the dirt and the mud. It's, it's so uh, quintessential 1960s football. And it's so that that Super Bowl uh, or that Sports Illustrated cover so uh, captured the Jets and Joe. Super cool super poised, and of course, Super Bowl winners. And one of the reasons why Joe was so successful is because of number 13, Don Maynard. And uh, he's one of those guys, I'd like to say, in a lot of ways, and I did uh, reference the Cincinnati Reds, 
But I think that Maynard is going to come down as or is seen as a guy not multi-talented, had some speed, great hands, without a doubt, great hands. He, he talks – actually, when I was reading uh, the Wikipedia version of his, uh, his life – he actually stated that the over-the-shoulder, reverse over-the-shoulder catch that he caught uh, from Joe Namath in the championship game against the Oakland Raiders was his greatest catch of his history, uh, of, of his career. And then people forget that he actually caught the winning touchdown in that championship game. And that was one where he kind of cradled it. It almost looked like the Jackie Smith, and of course I'm alluding to Jackie Smith, a great Hall of Fame tight end with the Cardinals, the St. Louis Cardinals and the Dallas Cowboys, who inadvertently dropped a tough pass in the Super Bowl against the Steelers that wouldn't have given uh, the Cowboys a lead, but would have made things quite a bit closer. I, I Well, I, I take that back. It might have given them the lead, but I know this. They had to settle for a field goal. And, you know, it changed the whole, but it does change the whole complexion of the game. And, you know, it, it's it's such a shame that great players sometimes have that one moment on the great stage and it's seen as failure. And too often uh, we recount not Jackie Smith's career as a Hall of Fame tight end with the St. Louis Cardinals, but of course that play. And, uh, and I'm not saying it defines him, but that's the first thing that quite a few NFL fans think about, the drop pass from Roger Staubach. Anyway... I'm going to accentuate the positives about Maynard and did realize this. His father, his, his, his family was always on the move as he was growing up. He actually attended about 13 or 14 different schools and five different high schools. But when he came out of high school, uh, he does go to a small college and then transfers to University of Texas, um, El Paso, which was then known as Texas Western. Up until, I think, about 1970, they're seen as Texas Western. If you recall, the Texas Western basketball team of 1966, which was the first to start an all-black team, uh, was known as Texas Western. And they were still, and to this day, known as the Miners. I always liked their uniforms because it has orange and blue. And uh, always kind of liked UTEP, too. Uh, simply because of the acronym UTEP, it, it's kind of crazy. Uh, uh, many schools just go with the hyphen Texas El Paso. They went with UTEP, and I think it's worked pretty well for their program under the ga- uh, great Don Haskins. Anyway, I didn't realize this, and I have to do some checking, but I'm just going to say this right now: if he leaves and he plays three years with Texas Western UTEP. Actually, those Texas Western teams have some very good seasons. Do you realize that his first year, and I, 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 again, I have to take a look. UTEP went, Texas Western went 8-3. and three. The following year, they went 6-2-2. Two and two. And then the following year, 56, his graduating season, he went 9-2. and two. Uh, That team, or that during that time frame, right before Maynard arrived, but they went to three uh, Sun Bowls. And actually won two of the three. And when I was watching UTEP play earlier uh, in the college bowl game season, had not realized they hadn't won a game, a bowl game, since 1967. Uh, and in that year, 1967, ready for this, they finished 7-2-1 and one under Robert Dobbs. And they finished and then beat Ole Miss 14-7 in the Sun Bowl. So it's quite remarkable. Uh, During the years that Maynard was at UTEP, their coach was a guy by the name of Mike Brumbelow. And uh, he was quite successful there. Really, really changed the program. Uh, Brumbelow had winning seasons every year he was there. He coached from 1950 to 1956, but didn't realize this. He was two and one in bowl games, Brumbelow. In 73 games, he was 46 and 24, a 651 winning percentage. Now, they did play in a league that was called the BIAA, and that was really composed of future, um, future, uh, um, well, Arizona State and Arizona were in it, and they would go on to the WAC and then would now be in the Pac, uh, Pac 12. And then there was another team in there, New Mexico State. 
that is now playing independent. But they also had a pretty good football factory program. And I, I say factory program. And that was Harden Simmons, who, if you had seen earlier shows, they went to a couple of these uh, unique or non-existing bowl games today. But obviously you can see that it was composed of Southwest uh, teams, mostly from Texas, obviously two from Arizona and one from New Mexico. But anyway, he played on these teams and um, they were quite good. UTEP under uh, Brumbelow. And, oh, I just found his rushing and receiving in 19... 19- 56, his final year with UTEP, he actually played 10 games, had 74 rushing attempts. So you know he had some speed. He was just really a string bean of a player. He, You know, the funny thing is, if you take a look, oh, wow, why don't I just show his his cards? And I apologize for that. I do have them. Unfortunately, I, I could only get black and white. But here he is, Jets. This is 1968, I do believe. So this is their championship season. And take a look. He is not chiseled. Um, he is not heavily muscled. He doesn't even have uh, weight on him. I'm thinking this. He might have been six foot at his best, and I don't have his weight measurement right now. But looking at him, he looks like a six foot, 175, maybe tops 180 wide receiver. So he's a little bit of a gazelle, but he unquestionably had great hands. Uh, probably he and Bolitnikov. And Otis Taylor in the AFL probably had the best hands of any wide receivers during those 60s. And make no mistake about it, they they were three great wide receivers who all helped their teams win Super Bowls. All right, T- took a little bit longer for Bolitnikov, but Otis Taylor, of course, was a star in the 1970 uh, Super Bowl against the Minnesota Vikings. And, uh, of course, Maynard interestingly enough, did not catch a pass in the 69 Super Bowl. In fact, he was a decoy and was told he was going to, going to be a decoy. Now, in that Super Bowl, he was hurt coming in. He actually got hurt in the championship game against the Raiders. However, he never complained about not being a target of Joe Willie. In fact, Joe Willie, Joe Namath, only uh, connected on 17 of 28 passes. And of course, he was the MVP. But of all the quarterbacks in, in the Super Bowl, I would argue he probably engineered one, still the greatest uh, upset victory in NFL history, just for the significance of it all. Number two, uh, probably he was the one who was the chess master of all quarterbacks, at least for that one game. I know that prior to that, uh, yeah, you did have uh, – you know, Bart Starr calling signals. You had uh, Len Dawson calling signals. But even with Len Dawson, as you see in the football um, highlights of the Super Bowl 1970 with Minnesota, Len Dawson was getting a lot of plays off the bench. Pretty much, Joe Namath will state, and I, he's not bragging and he's not being braggadocia here and he's not being narcissistic, but He'll tell you if you if if you watch the interviews that he called about seventy five. I'm even going to go say ninety percent, but I, it's probably more like 80 percent of the plays against the Colts from the line of scrimmage. And of course, not being a selfish player, or learned not to be a selfish player, or rather learned that he didn't have to do it all on himself. People don't realize that he did not throw a single pass in the fourth quarter and ate up clock just by uh, a various number of rushing plays to Snell and Emerson Boozer, uh, et cetera. But he, it was, if you ever watch that game, a lot of people think it's boring. <laughs> a lot of people think that it was more the Colts making mistakes. I know they do turn the ball over quite a, uh, a few times in the game, especially in the first half when they definitely had scoring opportunities. Uh, what is not looked upon if you take a, Really a nonpartisan look. And I have to tell you, I was not rooting for the Jets in 1969. I was an NFL fan, so I was rooting along with my brothers for Johnny U and the Colts. <laughs> the following year or two years later, I would hate the Colts because they would beat the Cowboys because now they're in the AFC. But anyway, uh, Maynard became a real favorite of 
Namath, uh, they really had, uh, they were really on target. And if you take a look at the great wide receivers, it's not coincidental that they have been locked in with a quarterback for a number of years with them. Probably the exception is Rice. I know he had Montana and then he would have um, Steve Young. But for the most part, Rice and Montana, that's who we think of. For It really is first and foremost because they won three Super Bowls together. When we think of Drew Pearson, at least for me, and I, I'm saying he's my favorite wide receiver, okay? So uh, you think of Staubach. And obviously when you think of Maynard, you're thinking of Joe Namath. And I'll, I'll give you others. Stallworth, Terry Bradshaw, uh, Bolitnikoff. Well, Bolitnikoff might be a little bit different because you have LaMonica and then you have <laughs> actually have a little bit of George Blanda there. And then you also have Ken Stabler, who we spoke about. Uh, I'm just thinking of other wide receivers that were fantastic or just stood out when I was uh, growing up or watching. And uh, anyway, those are the ones that really hit me the most. But here's the interesting thing. Maynard, of course, runs 74 times, 387 yards, has a 5.2 um, rushing attempt. And then, really, ready for this, he only caught the ball eight times in that final season while at uh, UTEP uh, for 275 yards. But here is one thing about Maynard, and that is that his yards per catch maybe had very few yards per catch. Um, but you can see he has hands of gold. And as I, I, I stated before, Maynard wasn't, let's say, he was probably country strong. And what I mean is that he probably really, uh, his physical attributes were probably shaped on uh, the Texas Plains, you know, just playing hard-nosed football, hard-nosed sports, and all the rest of it. And so he probably had what I like to call uh, like man strength at a very young age. But you can see he's not, I'm, I'm telling you right now, uh, I wonder if he would even be a projected draft pick with the size and shape of his body. I mean, because let's, let's face it, our wide receivers today, they look like chiseled Greek statues. And every one of them is 6'3 to 6'5". And they are monsters. They're about 225, 230. In, uh, and, and, you know, they can run the, the 40 in, in you know, 4.1, 4.2 speed, uh, et cetera. So they are just gifted athletes. Even our tight ends have become, you know, not so much blockers and kind of uh, safety valve receivers, but they have become really a part of the offense today. And that's how things have changed. Today, would Maynard make it? Yeah, I think he would. And I think he would on the level that uh, a Pete Rose has made it in baseball. All right. Uh, and, and you can think of guys like Steve Tasker, you know, with the Buffalo Bills. And also Drew Pearson. You know, Drew Pearson wasn't seen. He was a free agent. I don't even think he was drafted by the Cowboys. In fact, he was a quarterback at Tulsa. So uh, the Cowboys probably drafted him for being the Cowboys for the fact that he had or signed him uh, because he had multiple abilities on a football field. You know, you could run an option play with him, a trick play because he had, uh, uh, he had been a quarterback and he's a guy from South river, New Jersey, same school. I think that produced Joe Theismann. Anyway, he goes on to his career in the NFL. And I just really want to pick out the 1968, uh, New York Jets, and just go over some of the teams. And, uh, of course, they were coached by Weeb Eubank. Didn't know this. I didn't realize that Walt Michaels and Buddy Ryan were both uh, part of the defensive uh, unit or defensive coaching staff. I mean, I knew Buddy Ryan was because they always made a big deal when he won with uh, the Bears. That you know, I, I, I'm going to just say this, and I'm probably wrong saying this, but I, I, I think he might have been the first defensive coordinator to win two Super Bowls with two different teams, whatever. But um, that Jet team, ready for this? They had a guy named Emerson Boozer, who I love, number 32. Matt Snell from Ohio State, number 41. And, of course, all you Jet fans I know, you probably still reminisce about he scored the first touchdown in the Super Bowl for the New York Jets. Uh, you had Don Maynard, Pete Lamons. And, and here's the difference. 32 catches. Now, it is a 14-game season, in, even in the AFL. So he's getting the ball, or he's catching the ball a little bit more than 
two catches a game. But uh, only 400 yards. Well, it's still pretty good because it's over 10 yards a catch, but 400 yards. All right. I'm just saying that tight ends are more part of the game today than they ever were as an offensive weapon. Then he had George Sauer, who was the big star for the Jets uh, in Super Bowl three. He came up with, put it this way, he had some incredible catches in that game. He had some important catches in that game. And I think he had a total of eight or nine catches against the Colts. And I keep saying a number of catches or important catches because Sauer did play a huge role uh, with Maynard serving basically as a decoy. And they never wanted to give out the fact that uh, Maynard was injured. Uh, then you have Randy Rasmussen, who I recall, I think was the last of the Jet players from that 69 uh, Super Bowl team to retire. And of course, on the defense, kind of overlooked that defense. And I'm going to get into it with the with the Jets. They had guys like Jerry Philbin, who had a unique name as a kid because I always spelled it with F-I when it was P-H, like Philadelphia or Flor Florent uh, Philanthropist and all the rest. And so it has that P-H. Paul Rochester, mm, John Elliott, who I did, uh, I do remember, Verlin Biggs, who I do remember. And then they had guys like Larry Grantham, Al Atkinson, and a guy who played a big role in the uh, Super Bowl three, Johnny Sample, along with uh, Randy Beverly. So those were the guys. And of course, uh, the highest score for the Jets, people don't realize this, was Jim Turner, who had three field goals and an extra point. He had 10 points for the Jets. It's amazing how kickers, who are always, they always look very frail, and they always seem to be like the last guys that you chose on a football team. And they wind up being really like a relief pitcher in in baseball today. They become your most important and they have to be your most reliable because you can have a quarterback have just a stink bomb game, but he manages maybe to get like three or four drives for you, score two touchdowns to keep you in the game. And then he's able to engineer you into two field goal uh, spots. And, you know, the other team has scored 17. So now you got to score the tying three points and then win the game. And so you can see how many games do come down to the field goal uh, kicker's foot. And that is why many times it is amazing this way that the field goal kicker, you know, they go from team to team. Just take a look. There's not too many field goal kickers that stay with one uh, football team for their entire career. In fact, I'm even trying to think of one. Even Jim Turner would leave the Jets and show up uh, with the uh, Denver Broncos and kick a field goal and an extra point in that game when they lost to the uh, Dallas Cowboys in their first uh, Super Bowl appearance. Anyway, let's get back. All things um, Don Maynard. But I just want to go over Maynard's career. He really has a great uh, career. You know, he was... Really, I, I was looking at this. 1969, he played 11 of 14. And 1970, he played 10 of 14. And outside of 1963, Maynard was a pretty reliable, pretty um, injury-free football player. And as I stated, the reason why I make that big deal about Maynard is that he is hurt going into the 69 uh, Super Bowl game, game three you know, Super Bowl three, but he does lead the league in yards with 1,434 in 1967. And he does in 1968 in the Jets quintessential year, he led the league with 22.8 yards per catch. Now it doesn't, just to give you in terms of context, three straight years and four times in his career, he averaged 20 yards a catch. Now, the game is totally different now, and, th and this is what I mean, and this is where you have to take it in context. Uh, probably in that day, the pass was not used as an outlet play or as, uh, as another option besides, let's say, a three-yard dive or a five-yard off tackle or, let's say, a seven-yard sweep. And really, that comes with guys like Bill Walsh, 
with his quote unquote West Coast offense. Um, and he would just, I mean, he really perfected it with a guy named Roger Craig. But listen, instead of churning up the middle where there's all these bodies and stuff, they would either fake it inside or deliberately just go into, you know, an open area on the side or in the slot and pick up five, six yards that way. And I really believe it was um, probably, you're going to you're gonna laugh when I say this, I bet you that if they did a study, it might even be a healthier way of keeping your players injury-free. And what I mean is this, there wasn't all these thousand pounds of body mass uh, going this way and going this way, meeting in the middle at the line. And then that poor running back, of course, they're bigger now too, worrying about, you know, someone spiking him, someone uh, turning his ankle or even someone stamping on his leg. You know, when you have that body mass, that big rumble in the middle, there is, I am sure, quite more of a chance of, you know, somebody getting hurt. And I'm not laughing at somebody getting hurt, but, you know, just thinking, thinking of these freight trains coming at each other instead. And, and, and this is why I say you have to take what, um, and I'm going to get back to that Walsh would throw to, you know, little outlets where that running back, you know, it was really his talent against uh, a defensive back or maybe a linebacker, their talents and his speed would probably overwhelm the linebacker. All right. And his size would probably overwhelm, the defensive back. So if you're getting five, seven plays that way, just dishing out, just think what you're doing. All you're asking is your linemen just basically hold off the line men from getting to your quarterback and just almost like an assist in basketball. I'm, he's the guy out on the wing. Boom, you little pump, five, six yards. Boom, you're still wasting time if you're ahead. So it's not like uh, you're worried about an incomplete stopping the clock, especially if, uh, you know, you have a, a you know, a, a lead that can be shrunk uh, on the next possession and make it into a game. All right. So what they were probably doing in the sixties. And of course, let's face it, they loved the bomb and that was the big pass play. And probably the other thing they would do instead of deking and dumping it, they would go over the middle for 10, 12 yards. Now, why is this important? Well, uh, the number of catches, let's just say that Maynard made, yeah, it's just a shame. He was three yards shy of 1,300. But really, when you think about it, in 67, he averaged 100 yards a game passing in terms of pass catching. And just in his 13 games that he played in 68, he averaged just a little bit under 100 yards because he finished with 1,297. Basically, 100 yards a game in those back-to-back -back seasons. That's pretty unbelievable. And whether you take it in context of the 60s or of today, that's a great season uh, by those wide receivers. That's really um, over the over over the top. And anyway, what I'm saying is if they were going to throw the ball to their wide receivers, they were going to do it in a significant sense. You know what I do like about this picture? The concentration, even for a football card with Maynard on the ball. You can see that his eyes are on the laces on the ball. Anyway, so – Passing was a little bit deeper then, wasn't as successful. And if you take a look at the percentage, you know, it's a totally different game uh, from the 60s that it is today. Rules have changed. Uh, the offense is more open. Players can do uh, on the offensive side. They have many more uh, options and they, they have many, there are many more rules that are geared to increase offensive production. I don't know, really. I, I think most football fans, and this is just an aside, I think they'd rather see like a 27-24 game where the defense makes some big stops rather than every game almost being arena football. After a while, you do get tired of 51-48 games. I know that. I know that the NFL got tired of also seeing 10-3 football games and that many football fans don't like low-scoring games. Wow, we're on a host of different things here. But as I remind you, this is us sitting in a bar, uh, having a couple of beers and a hamburger, and we're just talking all things sports. And it's Maynard who got me off on the 1968 Jets and all the other stats and everything else. Maynard also led one other thing. He actually had 14 touchdown catches in 1965. And I believe that was the first year of full-time Joe Namath. So, you know, when you think that he was just maybe a blue-collar type of player, 
He, like Rose, uh, did enough and he did it quite well at the highest level to be a significant player. And that's why he's in the Hall of Fame. You know, uh, many of these Hall of Fame players, it doesn't hurt that you're playing for a Super Bowl. And that Maynard, let's face it, is linked to the Jets' greatest quarterback and probably their most important player. And I would argue that Namath, even though the AFL and NFL had already decided to uh, combine their leagues, Namath is probably the most significant player uh, or even the, the most significant person in AFL history. He really is. Especially, and it all comes from the guarantee. Had he never said guarantee and they and they did it in a stunning fashion, everyone would say, oh my God, they were lucky. But the fact that Namath kind of guarantees the game really tells me that Namath uh, was really uh, uh, was an erudite when it came to football. Now, he doesn't ever win again, and he, he is hampered by tons of injuries. He has a high frequency of interceptions compared to touchdowns. But let's face it, I think Namath knew the game, and he loved being a field general. And when you have a guy like Don Maynard that you can trust – on, in big spots, big plays, uh, it makes your life as a football quarterback that much easier. Okay, so Namath, people don't realize this, and I forgot this too, that really uh, the Jets and uh, Maynard cut ties in 1972. He eventually plays one season, uh, actually plays two games with the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, really, his career was over. He was already 38. People don't also realize – or don't realize that he did play one season with the Giants. He had five catches for 84 yards. I got to be honest with you. He goes off to the CFL, and I'm thinking to myself, uh, did the Giants not see something in him? Uh, because that was 1958. In fact, I just want to see. I'm pretty sure the Giants, uh, that year they finished first. And... Um, the Giants in 58 finished first, but they lose to the Colts 23-17. It was that game. And I just, listen, I wasn't going to jump out. Sometimes I will say something that I have to correct myself later. But Maynard was part of that team that played in what is uh, seen as the greatest football game in the history of the NFL when the Colts beat the Giants in Yankee Stadium uh, in overtime with Alan and Amici running over. Uh, and the Jets actually... Really, when you think about it, it would never happen today because today, and this is why it's corporate coaching in a way, uh, they would have kicked the field goal rather than risk going for a touchdown, especially since um, both teams had possessions if they were playing under today's rules, just kick the field goal and get out. Instead, Unitas and the Colts, and I really think, you know, you could argue this, and now I'm going off on another tangent. I think that the Colts probably did that, uh, ran the ball over instead of kicking it because I, I – I think maybe deep down, Unitas and the Colts just wanted to prove to everybody it wouldn't be a lucky chip shot that would end the game, that it was just brute force by the Colts uh, that sealed the deal to win the championship game. All right? So uh, Maynard was on, on that team. I And, again, I'm going to have to do further investigation uh, on this, and I'll get back to you on that. I'd love to see if I can get a box score of that 50. 58 game and C. And I would also love to know, you know, Wikipedia and other references, it's almost like Maynard, either he had, uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm just guessing, and it's probably somewhere along the line, there's probably some truth to this. Maynard probably had, could have had a, a fallout with management. Jim Lee Howell was their coach, could have had a fallout with the Giants. Uh, maybe though, the Giants missed the fact that Maynard was quite a pass catcher. And of course they do have uh, some famous uh, receivers in, uh, in their history uh, with of course, uh, Frank Gifford always coming uh, to the top of my head with the giants, but perhaps they just had a fallout or maybe they just missed on Maynard. But I got to be honest with you. When I see a guy who is in double figures in pass catching yardage and indeed only five yards for eight, five catches for 84 yards. He must be doing something right to at least give him another year. Now he goes off to the Hamilton Tiger Cats of the CFL 
And then it's one of the first players signed by the Titans uh, in the AFL. And I was looking at this. Do you know that he was he is one of I think he is one of 20 players who started in the AFL or was an original member of the AFL and was there until the very end. I did not know that either. And this is what I love. And this is why I appreciate Howard giving me the opportunity to this. I get to learn so much more about players I grew up with or about the sport itself just by doing these investigations. All right. I did show this picture and I have a few minutes, but uh, before I go, I have to read. I always love the backs of the cards. And anybody who knows me as a cartoonist will understand why I love it. Not only do you get little stats, which were excellent, but you get the little cartoon as well. And believe me, I used to look forward to that. And I made it large enough to so I don't have to use my specs. But it says, in 1967, Don was voted the club's MVP. And, of course, I went over the 67 season. 1,400 yards. Uh 10 touchdowns, and a 20.2 yards per catch average. As he led the AFL in yards gained and an average per catch, 20.2. Now, that's interesting because sports reference doesn't have it as uh, in bold that he led the league. Okay. He has um, and an average gain per catch, 20.2. He has speed to spare and can catch anything within reach. Both of those things are true. Because he did have, I'm pretty sure he was seen as having track star uh, speed, and he had hands of gold. I mean, they were hands of gold, not of stone. <laughs> and it says with the cartoon, I love this, uh, follow me. That's great. The balloon, two words. Last year, Don led the NFL, with, or the AFL, with 22.8. Average gain per reception. Say that like 16 times fast, and it's pretty hard to do. But there is the balloon. Uh, there is the cartoon on the back, and there is the information. And I got to be honest with you. It is valuable information because you got to remember, when we were growing up, the only thing we had in terms of stats and really finding out more about players initially was the backs of the cards. We didn't have what came out in like 72 or 73, the baseball encyclopedia, and now has really brought forth all of these things like this great site, Baseball Reference or Sports Reference, uh, the family of sports reference, football, hockey, basketball, uh, college and pro sports. So we didn't have that. So these were really valuable lessons. And of course, if you never collected cards, that number up there does not indicate his jersey number. That is the number in the card series. So... Um, Sometimes you wanted the low cards. Sometimes uh, if, if you waited all the summer, I'm pretty sure, I think I did this already. Willie Mays in 1970 had to wait until August uh, for his issue to come out. I think he was number 600, or I want to say he's either 600 or 660. But there have been players who are great players who are like number one or number 100 and all the rest of it. But um, so it didn't matter per se. Uh, what number was on. It was the guy on the front that was important. Okay. And then I found this and I just like to do uh, a quick thing. I've talked about Larry Wilson. Obviously we devoted the whole show to the jets and to Don Maynard and his passing and at the age of 86. And of course I told you he's the first NFL player, something he was very proud of to reach 10,000 yards as the first guy, Charlie Joyner finally uh, uh, exceeded that total in 1974. Uh, 1978. And then Charlie Taylor, another great wide receiver, another great player that I loved, number 42 for the Redskins. Uh, he was always paired, as I remember as a kid, with Sonny Jurgensen. But the other two guys, uh, Maxie Bourne played for a linebacker, played for the Rams. And this guy down here, Lonnie Wright. And I'm just going to end the show with Lonnie Wright. He was uh, a born and bred and unfortunately passed away New Jersey. He was a Garden Stater. He's from Essex County originally. Uh, he played at Colorado, I do believe, real quick. And um, the card, ironically, is with the Cincinnati Bengals. So he was taken, let's say, in the expansion draft, but he played two years in the AFL, both with the Denver Broncos. 
This is Will O'Toole for Park Ridge Sports History, reminiscing about the career and football life of Don Maynard. Thank you for joining me. See you next week.